Well, I'd thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, we put this down as a charitable act, <laughs> inviting me to come. It really is nice to see you. And uh, I do thank Helen and Mark and the rest of the team for the kind invitation to be here. Um, now, I haven't spoken, because of the holidays, I haven't spoken for a while. So I just feel I've got a long... No, no, I won't be. <laughs> I'm going to be very disciplined. I can't see the clock. Is it still Sunday? Yep. And uh, it's really nice to be here. And thank you for the smiles that I'm seeing. I'd like to just bring a little challenge to you. Now, before you think, oh dear, I don't need a challenge. I've had a... No, I'd like to just... The world talk about New Year's resolutions, don't they? And um, I've already broken mine, but it, it was Greg's. And um, so anyway, um, I was actually preaching in Yorkshire last year and um, I put a bit of weight on and I said, this is Greg's. And someone shouted out from the congregation, you don't have to go in. <laughs> and he's no longer a member, may I say. <laughs> He lost his membership instantly. But um, so we make resolutions, and they're, they're, they're a bit of fun, and they're good, and sometimes we keep them, sometimes we don't. But the whole point of a resolution is to look at our lives and think to ourselves, you know, um, is there anything I need to change or do differently in this coming year? Well, I'd like to ask you to make a New Year's resolution today. Um, I'm going to take you back to the book of Joshua, if I may, in the Old Testament, if you're looking for Joshua, start at Genesis and work in. If you start at Revelation and work back, I'll be finished before you get there. Um, Joshua 24. The background is this. The children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt, okay, the ministry of Moses. And then Joshua took over, took them into the promised land. And we're almost at the point where the promised land is completely theirs. But there is still some work to do. And Joshua is now knocking on a bit. And um, as it happens to all of us, and um, he brings the people together to bring them a challenge. It wasn't a New Year's resolution, but it was a decision he was going to ask them to make. So if you have Joshua 24, I'm going to read verse 1, and then I'm going to go to verse 14. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Sheshem. He summoned the el elders, leaders, judges, officials of Israel... They all presented themselves before the Lord. So everybody was there. Let me stop there. Everybody's there. I said, well, all the tribes and the leaders had to be there. This wasn't a thing for the congregation. This was something for everybody. And that's not an aggressive statement to this church. It's just part of the background. So he calls them together, and he's going to bring a challenge. And we get to verse 14, and it says this. Now fear the Lord and serve him. With all faithfulness, throw away the gods of your forefathers' worship beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord and to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us up and our fathers out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on the entire journey among all the nations whom we traveled. And the Lord drove out before them all the nations, including the Amorites whose land in whom we live. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord. Hmm? Hang on, you just asked them to do it. You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is holy, he is jealous. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. And if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. I'm going to stop there. I need to pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing story 
And we thank you for characters such as Joshua who served the Lord all their days. And Lord, as we begin this new calendar year for us, we ask, Lord, that you might help us to make a decision, a recommitment today to serve you. Well, it's very simple, the story. I'm sorry if the reading went a little bit long, but I needed to give you the context. Very simple. Joshua's about thinking, I'm going to retire soon. And he's thinking he wants to get the people to a place where they will make that commitment. And he comes to them and he says to them in verse 14, very simply, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers' worship beyond the river. So he's coming here. He's aware that although they were in the will of God, they were in the promised land, they'd been brought out of Egypt, he was aware there was still a spiritual problem within the nation. And as Helen, it was a great illustration, they had things in their pockets they needed to get rid of. Things they had picked up, things they had brought with them from Egypt, things they had brought with them from the wilderness, um, attitudes, idols, superstition. And Joshua's basically coming to them and saying, listen, now we're here, now God's kept his word. Now we've been set free. I'm coming now and I'm going to ask you to make a decision to serve the Lord. A recommitment. And that's what I'm asking today. That we might be, we can't, we can do it collectively, but it's basically individually. I'm praying that every one of us here will say, you know what? I want to just say to the Lord again, please, you're serving the Lord. You're serving the Lord yesterday. I, this is no criticism of anybody. But at fresh commitment to serve the Lord. The story is quite unusual in many ways. Um, he says to them, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, he acknowledged it. He gave them a chance. They had a choice. He says, do you want to serve the Lord or don't you? If you think it's undesirable, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. This is your chance to make your decision. Okay? If serving the Lord seems undesirable, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river, that's of course the, the Jordan, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then he makes a statement, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was not going to be led by their decision. Now the whole of Israel decided we're not going to serve the Lord. Joshua says, I'm not bothered what you do. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you know, there's so many pressures today for, for us as, as, as Christians, the world we live in, um, to, to be conformed to the world. And we get affected by it. And every now and again, it doesn't do us any harm to say, do you know what, Gordon, I, I'm with you here. I need just to say to God, you're my God, and I'm going to serve you. And I'm not going to be affected by people around us. Do you know that if the United Nations made a decision today that Jesus wasn't Lord, you know he still would be, don't you? There are some things that can't go to the vote. We can vote governments in and governments out. We can vote for this and vote for that. We can elect in the regional superintendent. We can do all sorts of things. But I'll tell you this, God is God. And Israel had to make that decision. But of course, Joshua doesn't come to them and just get, say to them, listen, you've got to serve God. He says to it, um, they said in verse 16, the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord and serve other gods. And then they repeat something that Joshua had just said. They repeat the basis on which we serve God. God doesn't expect us to serve him without a purpose. Just a few moments ago, we took emblems in remembrance of the death of Jesus Christ. Why do we serve the Lord? Because he has redeemed us. He is our saviour. He's forgiven our sins. And Israel say this, far be it from us to forsake and serve other gods. And then they say, was it the Lord our God himself brought us out of Egypt? And then they relay about their deliverance, how God had set them free, how God had um, brought them into the land and had blessed them and protected them. And they had that basis. So our basis of serving God is not, oh, for example, if I said to you this morning, Will you all love me? You go. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I, I did. I thought with the money I gave you, you'd have said that a bit louder. Anyway, you know, um, you'd say, "Well, why? We, we don't know. You're just walking here, you know." 
park your car, come in here. We, we want some basis for it. Now, if it's my children or my wife, I'll say, do you I think they've got a bit of basis, hopefully, to, to make the statement ring true. And there, Joshua had reminded them how God had brought them out of Egypt, had protected them, had blessed them. Our serving God is not without a basis. Our basis of serving God is first based on the cross. And what a lovely, lovely, sing that hymn again. Very moved by it. And that's the basis which God. So I come to you today. I'm going to call myself Joshua Neil. Joshua Neil says here, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me, I'm serving the Lord. My decision to serve God is not based on the government, it's not based on, with respect, who the pastor might be, or whoever it is. No, no, my basis of serving God is based on that he's my deliverer, he's my saviour, he's my protector. I happen to be an Elam, a retired Elam minister, but I'll tell you this, I wouldn't die for Elam. I might die for Jesus, hopefully, if I, hopefully I don't have the choice, but, and that's whom we serve. But, you know, Joshua wanted them to understand this. He says to them, this one, Joshua said to them, verse 19. So he comes to them and says, you're going to serve the Lord. Said, yeah, 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 we're going to do it. So he throws out the challenge and he gets a positive response. The people said, we will serve the Lord because he is our God. In verse 19, Joshua says something quite strange. He says there, you are not able to serve the Lord. Hang on a minute. He just asked them to do it. And now he's saying, you can't do it. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will. They said, okay, we're with you. Joshua will serve the Lord. He said, no, no, you won't. Why? Why throw out the challenge? Well, what he was doing was he wanted them to understand what that meant. See, serving the Lord is a very important thing. It's the most important driving force in our lives. That is not to diminish our families and our careers and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, the most important thing in our lives is first that we're serving the Lord. And from that, we become better fathers, we become better husbands and and wives, etc., etc., in that way. So he says to them, you're not able to serve the Lord. Why? He is a holy God. Wow. God's a holy God. And before we make a recommitment to serve him, we have to remember God is a holy God. Do you know, I used to be quite intimidated by the holiness of God. Um, after I became a Christian, I, I'm, I'm still very conscious of how sinful I am now, but before, when I first became a Christian, um, I was very conscious of what a bad person I had been. I hadn't understood that we're all sinners. I just, just so convicted of my sin and my behavior that it, it just it followed me around for too long. Then I got an assurance of salvation. But we find here that Joshua comes to him and he says um, that he is a holy God. And then I suddenly woke up one day that the holiness of God is not a threat to me. It's actually a foundation of my faith. Because if he is always holy, then he's always true, he's always faithful, he's always kind. Do you understand what I'm saying? His holiness isn't a judgment. It isn't, oh, God's holy and I'm a terrible sinner. He knows you're a terrible sinner. That's why he gave his son for you. That you might be a saved horrible sinner. And this year, try and sin a bit less than you did last year, all right? You know, I don't believe in sinlessness, but I believe in sinning less. You know, in that way. So he comes and says, he's a holy God. Non-negotiable. Whatever you decide now, God is holy. And then he uses a word that says there, he is a jealous God. Now, jealousy is not a good emotion. If you suffer from jealousy, you need, you need counselling quickly. Because one of the most destructive emotions that I have found in pastoral work is jealousy. Where, you know, it, if it takes root, you, you, so if you, you think, well, do you know, I think I'm a bit of a jealous person, Gordon. Well, then go and talk to somebody and get some help. It's not a matter of deliverance. It's a matter of just sorting out some, sometimes just your thinking and your attitudes. So he says, you can't serve because he is holy. He is jealous. He will not forgive your rebellion or your sins. In other words, God is going to take your decision seriously. Now, 
I'm married. I've been married about 4,000 years. The wife's only been married 50, but I've been married 4,000. And those vows we took seriously. Um, you know, for better or for worse, I've taken that seriously. Honor and obey, she's still thinking about it. <laughs> but, you know, we take things seriously. You know, you sign a form for a mortgage, that, that bank is taking it seriously. They want the repayments. If you don't think they're taking it seriously, stop paying. You know how serious that commitment is. And so he's coming to them and saying, listen, you can't do it because God is holy. God is jealous. In fact, when they did backslide, the story of Gideon, you know, the uh, Hittites came and, uh, you know, God keeps his word. You walk with him, he'll bless you. So, well, I don't sense God's presence. No, you might not because you've got an unforgiving spirit. You're not forgiving people quick enough. That's one of the spiritual levels in my how quickly I can forgive people. If it takes a long time, I know I'm not close to the Lord. If I can do it almost instantly, then I might be a bit more spiritual than I thought I was. Very, very important on that. So he said, you're not able to serve the Lord. Um, he'll bring disaster on you if you don't. And then they said this, no, we will serve the Lord. Right. So Joshua says, would he serve the Lord? They said, yes. He says, are you sure? I don't think you can because he's a holy God. And if you don't keep your side of the bargain, disaster will come. And it did come. They went into Babylon, the story of Daniel. It all, it's all there. God takes our commitments seriously. And his holiness is an assurance to me that I am saved. That my faith and my trust in him will stand true. He's a jealous God. And when idols hang around in my life at all, he's jealous of the idols. Not in an emotional, vengeful way, but he's God. And we need to remember that. Okay, so they said that, no, we will serve the Lord. And then in verse 23, Joshua tells them the certain things they have to do. Now, I could have just preached this and stopped now, and I'm going to stop fairly soon, and say to you, right, let's bow our heads, put, you know, put your hand up if you're making a decision now to serve the Lord, in a, a, a recommitment to serving the Lord. I could have done that. And some of you have put your hands up. Okay? But this is the important bit. Now then, Joshua said, throw away the foreign gods that are among you. And we need to check whether we have any idols in our lives. So well, what do you mean? Well, I think of it this way. There's the keyboards. Please, don't be offended. If you're offended by this, you need help. <laughs> right? That's the Lord. And this is Gordon. Anything that stands between me and the Lord, that obscures my vision of him, I declare an idol. So, my hobby, if that's there, the hobby becomes an idol. My family, these things are not wrong, but they are in, they're not in the right place. The right place for my family is here. The right place for my hobby is here. The right place for my football team is in the premiership. <laughs> but we're not there yet, okay? Um, but, you know, so just check. Is there anything obscuring your view of the Lord Jesus? If it is... It doesn't mean it's evil or it's sinful. It means it's just got to move out of the way a bit. So if you worship your grandkids, carry on loving them, loving them a bit. But listen, just move them aside so that you can see the Lord clearly. Could be your career. Could be your car. There'll be people that are washing their cars. I wash mine when I'm selling it. <laughs> why, why would you wash a car before you're selling it? But some are worshipping their cars. And, you know, I'm making you smile and using some silly things, but there's some serious things in our lives. Most of them are not things, they're attitudes. They're little things that have crept in. A bit of jealousy, maybe, a little bit of envy, I don't know. It's there. But he says, listen, you've got to deal with these things. But the answer, and it's, this echoes into the New Testament, he says, throw them away. Throw them away. If you've not moved house recently... Let me tell you, when you do, you will throw a lot of things away. 
be like Helen emptying her pockets. You didn't see the cigarettes, did you? And, this, <laughs> and the lighter. No, no, that was a joke. You know, I, when we moved house, I went to the dump in Derby so often that they invited me to the Christmas party. <laughs> we, the stuff we collect. The stuff we collect. Unbelievable. And, you know, the, I'm looking at this piece of wood. And I must have thought one day I'll need that. Yeah. That's what men think. I'm going to need. So we have sheds full of bits of wood this length. You know, what? You can't even build anything with it. But I might. And we collect. And my daughter now has um, a fire place. So the wood goes to her. I brought you some wood. She said, oh, thank you, Dad. Not really. I'm just clearing out the shed in that way. But you've got to throw it away. These things, you've got to throw them away. You don't move these things, unless the family, you've already cleaned that one, cleared that one up. But attitudes and things, behavior, sinful things, just throw them away. They are of no value. In fact, they're taking up space that could be given over to God in that way. Okay, so he tells them to throw them away. Um, the foreign gods that are among you, and then this is the key to all. And I could, is this that he says, and yield your hearts. You see, serving God's always been a heart matter. Now, Helen won't believe this, but I have the perfect theology in every subject. <laughs> Absolutely perfect theology in every subject. But God doesn't want me to have the perfect theology. God doesn't want me to be the, the, the best regional superintendent. The, the, God wants my heart. Now, I could cause trouble in a lot of marriages here by telling you what a wonderful husband I am, but I won't do that, John. You know, you know I might do the washing up, I might do this, I might, you know, but, you know, but I can do all the jobs in the house, but my wife Kay wants my heart. Now, she still wants me to do the washing up, and it'd be a hard choice, I think, now for a wish. She'd want, but she wants my heart. And he says, listen, throw them away, very simply, and worship with all your heart and yield your, pardon me, and yield your hearts to the Lord. I'm going to stop now. Has he got your heart? Has God got your heart? Are there things we need to throw away? If you were Joshua, could you stand today and say, choose you this day whom you will serve. But whatever you decide, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm sure you will. But there might just be someone here who over the past year with all the pandemic and all that carry on, you know, and you're without excuse, may I say, that you're not walking with the Lord as you should. So when I say you're without, not without excuse, I can't excuse not walking with the Lord. I can't do it. It's, I have no room to do that. All I can say is I'm sympathetic to the challenges that we've all faced. And you say, well, as for me and my house, Gordon, we're going to serve the Lord. In fact, forget your house. As for me, I will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, 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 the warm welcome. I thank you for these good folk listening so attentively. And Lord, although my message has been a little higgledy-piggledy, I hope maybe that we bow our heads before you and we want to throw away foreign gods. We want to yield our hearts to you. And we want to serve you all our days. Our walk with you, our relationship with you, will affect every other relationship we have. So Lord, may I just say, and I will not be making an appeal in that sense, may I just ask you now, that you will say to the Lord, I will serve the Lord. In this new year, and God doesn't have a diary or a calendar, but for us it's helpful. In this new year, let's just get rid of the idols, let's clean our hearts, let's come to him afresh and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you with all my heart. Bless this church, bless its leaders, Bless every family and home represented. Amen.
Amen. Thank you very much for listening.